All right, the, announce, the announcement for tonight is on the screen. And, that, and um, so I was informed this morning that we needed to announce that if you want to sign up, that you need to go to slbc.org. That's for sugarlandbiblechurch.org. And so that gives you the information on the screen that it will be on April the 27th, Saturday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And Dennis Roxer will be, uh, will be teaching. And so you need to sign up uh, online so they know how many people are coming. So please be considerate and do that if you are able to attend. All right, well, we need a few moments to just focus and get our thoughts together and to be in right relationship with the Lord if we need to. And so we're going to uh, have a few moments of silent prayer, and uh, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, as we read through the study that we have tonight, it just impresses us with your grace, or it should, because we recognize that if we were there in the same place that the Israelites were at the foot of Mount Sinai, that we would probably be just as restless and bored and uh, rowdy as they were. And Father, we know that they were uh, just, just so amazed with uh, Aaron's uh, assessment when he talks to Moses. He says, you know... These people are evil, and that is just as true for us as it was for them, and we just uh, appreciate your grace in our lives and that we may learn not only to appreciate your grace, but also to treat others in grace as well. So Father, we pray that as we study tonight, as we reflect upon the process of inspiration, the process of uh, providing and developing the word and its significance, as well as understanding this rebellion of uh, the Israelites at Mount Sinai, that you'd give us insight into this and the implications of that as well. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so tonight we're looking at the... Wait a minute, I may have put that in the wrong spot. No, I did put that in the wrong spot. I don't know why I did that. It should have been up here. Okay. Okay. There. All right. So tonight where we're doing is we are in the second part of Lesson 15. So last week we looked at this, and it's Revelation at Mount Sinai, and we haven't finished the Revelation part because we're just get tonight getting to the second half of the lesson where it's still developing the principle of the developing of the canon of the Scripture. Canon is from a Greek word meaning a rule or standard. And the word canon is not just applied, for example, to Bible, the books of the Bible, but there was a lot of discussion about 15 or 20 years ago because a lot of those elite, now woke, uh, Ivy League schools were beginning to dump the canon of English literature. And so it refers to a standard collection of books that would be expected of people to read and to study and that were uh, that were um, that were important or significant, and so these are the writings that pass the test to be included in Scripture, and it, it's developed over the centuries. And so we'll talk about that. But last time we talked about the writing of the law, how God revealed Himself and His communication pattern. And in the Old Testament, this was done through a group known as the prophets, who were God's representatives to the people. Tonight, in the second half, we're developing the last part of that on the canon of the Scripture, and how biblical faith is related to divine revelation. That is the object of our faith, is what God has revealed to us. It's not faith in faith. It's not faith in some sort of inner feeling uh, all of those kinds of ideas are contrary to what the Bible talks about as faith. It talks about the, the Bible talks about faith as being that which is, which is logical, that which is rational, that which is uh, based upon the evidence that God gives. 
and it is not by and you do not put your brain in neutral in order to accept what the Bible says. But you have to study it, you have to understand it. And you have to recognize that most of us are reared with a lack of information, and so we think we make decisions to accept or reject Christianity or any claims without really looking at the evidence or studying it or, or reading it. And I remember that even though I grew up in church and even though I was probably a little bit more read on some subjects when I was in college, nevertheless, I heard a lot of things that I didn't was not prepared to handle. Um, and apologetics were not part of the curriculum that I grew up under other than dealing with creation and evolution, but there are just a lot of other things. That's why we want to use a, a material like this, a curriculum like this, in teaching and training young people from the youngest age, from kindergarten or preschool even, just teaching them, reading them Bible stories, telling them. So you read Bible stories over and over again when they're two and three years old because they'll keep hearing the names, they'll keep hearing the events. It's a familiarization tour. They're not going to be able to write a dissertation on you know, the seven things you learned about Moses at Mount Sinai. But they're, they'll recognize those names, and as, as they go through Sunday school, they'll, they'll develop they'll, your uh, one analogy that I've often heard is it's like building a closet. You don't just walk into the closet and throw your clothes in there. Well, some people do, I know, but you, that's not normative. First, you have to put some, uh, uh, put a couple of things on the wall that you'll hang your um, uh, clothing pole for hanging your clothes on, or you might go more advanced and get a lot of the newer things that are developed uh, for organizing closets. But once you get that framework in there, and that's what this kind of a course is, then you have places to hang the, you, the, the details of all the different uh, things that you buy related to clothing and everything, and to organize them and hang them up in the closet and do that. So that's, that's the idea, is first we have to sort of understand the structure and understand the framework of how we're going to then organize all the data uh, that, that comes our way. And so part of the question that comes up with people, well, how do you know this is really the Bible, or this is really God's Word, and what about all of the other uh, religions that claim that they have God's Word? And so last time, one of the things that we looked at was the two tests. That's what we concluded with, looking at the two tests out of Deuteronomy. And the first test is that um, it is a prophet, a prophet, and so he, he would give prophecy that would be fulfilled in the near future. Some of his prophecy may be far distant. You couldn't e evaluate that because you're not going to live that long. But that everything that he said and announced that would come true in the near future 100% had to come true or he was false and he was, to be, um, he, he was to be executed. He was to be stoned to death. Now that sounds pretty harsh for a lot of people. We're going to see another episode at the foot of Mount Sinai today that I think that, that uh, people go to and they operate from their own emotions, their own frame of reference without thinking through the context or anything. And they say, boy, that just seems like God is really harsh. But once you think about things and you realize that what God is doing is protecting the rest of the people in the nation from the rebelliousness and the evil of this one person, that it's like cutting cancer out before it has time to metastasize and influence other people. And so God has rules. He says when things start getting out of control, you have to nip it in the bud or you're going to have some serious problems uh, down, down the way. And one example today, I know it's very controversial, I know it's very sensitive for pe uh, certain people uh, in Israel, but it's what you read about uh, the demonstrations going on to, to do whatever it takes to get the hostages back. And even if that means releasing hundreds, if not a couple of thousand, terrorists who are in prison. And that is something that Israel has done many times in the past. 
The first time that I took a group to Israel was in 2006. And at right in the last couple of days that we were there, we were down in Elat, which is down on the Red Sea. And we were just headed back, and we got word that an Israeli so soldier had been taken captive by, um, by I, I don't I think it was Hamas, but by one of the Palestinian terrorist groups. And he was a prisoner for like five or six years. And when they bargained to, re to get his release, there were more than a thousand terrorists, really evil, murder, multi-murderers, those who had committed all kinds of atrocities that were part of the ransom to get Gilad Shalit back. And I read an article uh, several months ago that detailed the number, how many Israelis were murdered subsequent to that by those, the terrorists in that group that were released. And so by having a narrow focus and saying we need to get him back to save this one life, you release 1,500 terrorists, and those terrorists over the next 10 or 15 years are going to take the lives of, of several thousand Israelis. So you really haven't saved one life. You have, by doing it that way, you have destroyed it. So it's important to understand context on things. God recognizes that when there is evil, that it's important to deal with it early on, or it is going to blossom into some horrific, horrific circumstances. And so that's why some of these penalties seem to be so very, very, uh, very harsh. So we've gone through a timeline. We're not going to review it tonight. We are in the section dealing with the law. We've gone through the creation. Uh, God created all things, and then the fall because of human volition, because of their uh, irresponsible choice, their use of their uh, they, that because of their choices, their rebellion against God. Then there are going to be consequences, and those con consequences: spiritual death, separation from from God. But the death. The death is really a plenary term. That means a f it's, it's full. It's inclusive. It is primarily and initially spiritual death. But unless something happens, it culminates in physical death, and it also brings about de disease and famine and all kinds of other things. But it starts with spiritual death, and everything is under the condemnation of sin, and is separated, alienated is the term that Paul uses in Ephesians 4.18, we're alienated from the life of God. And so because of that, uh, God doesn't have a lot of structures. He hasn't created a lot any more of the divine institutions. He, the, the first three of the divine institutions are responsible choice, and then marriage, and then family. Those were created prior to sin for the purpose of enabling the human race to have prosperity. And as they grew in numbers, as they propagated the species from one generation to the next, they would be able to have uh, order and they would be able to uh, do, the, do the best in order to promote uh, prosperity and development for the future. But because of sin, uh, all of these were terribly... Uh, terribly corrupted in the period from Adam to Noah. And you have uh, the God's assessment of what's going on in Genesis chapter 6 is that the imagination of, or the thinking of man's heart was evil continuously. Evil. It's, it's not just, well, bad. They're, make, they're not making wise decisions. It's evil. And it's corrupt. And it was worse than what would have been experienced during the time of King Manasseh, who was one of the kings, uh, last three or four kings in the southern kingdom, where there were just, I mean, it was like a, a, a murderous, vicious, violent orgy 24-7 for years. And that was all that was involved in the worship of the, for, in the fertility religions, worshiping the gods and goddesses. But however bad that was, which was m worse than anything we can imagine that we have ever seen or experienced in our world, unless you're living in some really dark places in the world today, um, it, was, it was much worse than that before the flood. And so God 
has to eradicate all of that through the flood, through the worldwide flood. He has to cleanse the planet from all of this evil and start over. But it's not long before uh, evil rears its ugly head again, even within the family of Noah. And so we see that the problem isn't education, it's not environment, it's, it's not any of the things people want to pin it on. It's not poverty. It's not racism. It's sin, the sin nature that's within each one of us. And so this is, reaches a culminating state where God has to really begin to do something about it, and that's at the Tower of Babel. So he scatters the languages. Tower of Babel was an example of globalism, an, ex- an example of internationalism, and it leads to evil and destruction. So God stifles it. In God's omniscience, he knew that, the, that although there would be a lot of horrible results from having nations that would war against each other, enslave one another, and do all kinds of horrible things to one another, the alternative of globalism would produce that which was worse. And so there is the scattering of the languages at Babel, and God's going to sort of start over again with one individual and work through his descendants. And there, and, and in Deuteronomy several times, Moses makes the point that God didn't choose you because you were so great, because he knew you're a rebellious, stiff-necked people. And so, but it's an example of God's grace, and so grace rules uh, through all of this. So we're at the period, the last several lessons we have been talking about uh, the Mosaic Law. But after the flood, you have the institution of human government and nations and boundaries, and they restrain sin to a great deal. And just think if we were actually defending our, bo- our southern border from the hordes that are coming across it and invading this nation now, then we would have much greater law and order. But we're not told about much of the horrors and the violence and the evil criminal actions if they're committed by an, a person who's come over the border illegally, an illegal alien, then the news media will not report it. It's kept quiet because that would show how, how much a failure liberalism uh, really is. And so God is going to call out a new nation. They're, they're, the nation is birthed through Abraham. It is going to be, uh, grow to about three, uh, two and a half to three uh, uh, million people. And over the course of, of the next few years, and, um, and then they're going to go to uh, the land of promise. And that's the Exodus is a picture of their redemption. And the law is how they are to le- live as a redeemed people. Then uh, we go to, we'll go to the conquest next. So God is going to reveal himself to them, and this is the whole issue that God reveals himself in his word. He reveals himself through words. It's logical. To put words together in a sentence calls for grammar. I know that a lot of you don't like grammar. You're just like, I don't like numbers. But grammar, a a sentence doesn't make sense if it's not constructed rightly. The rules of grammar are rules of logic. So that if you have a, if you are going to construct a way, uh, let's say you're going to make a case for somebody to do something, you started doing that when you were a little kid. You started trying to convince your parents that you needed this or you needed that or you should go with your friends to do this or that. And so you're trying to present evidence that this is something that they should support. Well, the sentences that you used had to make sense. They were built on a structure called grammar that is base, is the foundation of, of all logic. And so God's word is, is from the logic of his omniscient brain. And he is breathing out his content through the prophets. And they wrote a lot of things down in terms of just historical data that were later used by writers of Scripture. It just didn't come all out of their head. They were guided by God the Holy Spirit and how they uh, found uh, information and records and historical records and used them 
First Chronicles 29, 29 says, Now the acts of King David, first and last, indeed they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, in the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer. These are the three main prophets during that period that we study in the books of First and Second Samuel. And so they, those were whoever the prophet was who put all of that together in its final form. And even, I think, the writing of it initially was under the oversight of God the Holy Spirit. In John, the Gospel of John, 21, 24, and 25, we read these last week, that John is speaking of himself, and he says this is the disciple. He's the disciple who wrote the book. Uh, this is the disciple who testifies of these things. I was, he's saying, I was an eyewitness of all these things. And I wrote these things. And we know that this testimony is true because there are, there's witnesses that can corroborate this. And he says also there were many other things that Jesus did. So we don't have an exhaustive anything when it comes to the life of Jesus. We have the key events that God wanted us to know about in order to be able to understand who Jesus was and what was going on when he came the first time and why he was, was rejected. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 tells us how God did it. God breathed it out. It is when, when we inhale, okay, we're taking air in and then we exhale it out. So as it were by analogy, the brain, the mind of the uh, prophets, writers of Scripture would inhale from God. God would breathe into them and they would inhale the content and then they would exhale it through their writing. And so it was clear that, it was, uh, that all Scripture is God-breathed. So Yahweh... God of the Bible, uh, would reveal th His Word over the, progressively in the course of history. So that a vast amount of things that happened were not recorded, were not part of Scripture. Only what God chose to record in the period from Adam to Noah, it's very, very little. I mean, you've got a period of about 2,000 years and you get it all covered mostly in a couple of genealogies in, a, in two chapters. So there, there's very little that we were told, probably because there wasn't much worth telling. And then it's written down by the prophet and preserved. And then it has to be transmitted from one generation to another. So the, the prophets devised the means by which this would take place, how it would be written, what the guidelines were, how they would preserve it, make sure that there was that when it was copied that it was uh, in a way that would keep it from ha having error. It wasn't the word of man about God, it was God's word to man. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, you shall not add to the word which I command you. So God is telling us, this is what I'm revealing. You don't come along and add more to it. You don't come along even later and say, oh, I think this book ought to be added in that book. That's not how the process worked. In the Old Testament, you had the, uh, the stamp of approval from the prophets. In the New Testament, you had the stamp of approval from the apostles and the New Testament prophets. But you, when, once you get past the era of the apostles, roughly 100 uh, A.D., then how did the early church go about this collection process? We'll talk about that a little bit. But it was a process of sort of, of recognition. You had, um, you had these, these writings scattered. Now let's say you're in Ephesus. And a messenger comes and brings a letter from Paul. And it is read out loud to the congregation. How would you respond to that? Say, well, I want to get a copy of that. Well, well, just go back to the copier in the back room and run off a copy. Well, they couldn't do that. You know, they had to sit down and make copies for people, so they began to develop standards for how this would be checked and double-checked and triple-checked to make sure that it was a, there were accurate copies. 
And it was, by the end of 2 Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, bring the scrolls with you. So the, people had these and were beginning to collect them. And so if you were in a place like Philippi and Thessaloniki, which is just uh, 30, 40 miles down the road, and then you would go down to Corinth, well, the people in Thessaloniki and Philippi probably shared uh, what they had with each other. So they would have a, people, some people had a copy of both of those letters. And maybe later on they would find out, well, Paul wrote a couple of letters to the church in Corinth, so we can get copies of that and we'll give them copies of what we had. And now you have four. And then you would have, and then th there would be Second Thessalonians, so you would add that in, so you've got five. And gradually these things develop, and then you go across the Aegean there, and now you're over in Turkey, what is now modern Turkey. You've got Ephesus, but, but Ephesus isn't very far from Colossae. So Paul wrote an epistle to Ephesus. Now, it's interesting, in a lot of, the, a lot of older manuscripts don't include the word Ephesus in the opening verse. It's assumed that it went there, but most, there's a, another good argument that it was really a cyclical letter that it was written to go be taken to this group of churches there. The book of Revelation starts with these letters to the seven churches. And they're all in that part of what was the Roman province of Asia or Western, Western Turkey. And so they would, would pass these around and they would collect them. So you have uh, Ephesus and Colossae. There were some other letters too to Hierapolis and some of the others, but they weren't preserved. The people recognized, well, you know, there's something different about that. Those, it, it's it's uh, the it's it's going to be uh, Colossi, Ephesus. Those those letters are are worth it. And then they would uh, be sharing these across the Aegean with the Greeks. And so you begin to collect these, and they would find out, oh, well, well, John the apostle wrote letters later on. And you have 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, and they find out about Peter. And Peter's writing to people a little bit to the northeast of those other ones. So over a process of time, people found out about others and began to collect them. And so you have a period in the second century called um, a period of separate circulation. And so they're just being circulated separately. And that goes from about 100 to about 150. And then you start to get a period of, of, uh, of collection where different collections were come. And, and in some groups, they would say, well, we've got this epistle of Barnabas, and we've got this, this other uh, document called the Teaching of the Twelve, the Didache. And we'll read that every now and then. But after a while, that just sort of died out because they, they realized that didn't have the substance to it that these, that these other writings had, Paul's writings and Peter's writings and John's writings. So they didn't stand, that didn't stand the test of time. And so by the time you get to the latter part of the second century, we know that there were, we have a fragment that was discovered uh, by an Italian archaeologist that had about 20, uh, 20 books in it that, are, that do, does not include anything, I believe, that, that we don't have, okay? In other words, it didn't include the Gospel of Thomas. It didn't include some of these Gnostic Gospels or anything like that. It, ha it didn't have all 26 or 27 books of the New Testament, but it had it had a lot of them. And then we've discovered other collections that might have 24, some might have 26. By the time you get to the end of the second century, there's a pretty accepted group that would be the 27 books that we have. And when you get to the mid part of the fourth century, around 350, there's a letter written by Athanasius, who's the bishop down in North, uh, North Africa and Egypt, and he lists the uh, authorized books, the accepted books, and it's tw our 27. That's the first time they really all show up. Now, there's some evidence possibly at Nicaea that they were recognizing this, but they're not saying, okay, these are the books and we've rejected the others. They're recognizing what had come to be accepted by the people and what wasn't used by the people. 
And so that's, that's the process. So no church council came along and said, okay, we're going to accept these and reject the others. That is not how it, how it worked. But that's what you'll hear from certain New Age people, Gnostic people. You know, as Shirley MacLaine had some things, nasty things to say about uh, Council of Nicaea, but she was out on a broken limb anyway. Okay, at the end of Revelation states, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. And I, you know, and I think that that's really talking about Revelation, but I can understand it has a broader implication because it is the last book revealed of Old and New Testament, and it is a statement that nothing more is to be added. There aren't going to be any more apostles. There are no more prophets. And so... Um, there, is, there are going to be serious consequences if you are going around calling other books the Word of God that were not authorized by God. And so we have the canon of Scripture. And those that were in the canon of Scripture passed the Deuteronomy test, those two tests for Old Testament. And in the Old Testament period, you not only had those, what we would call 39 books, they're combined differently by in the Hebrew canon. It's the same books, but they only have 22. So uh, Ruth is included with Judges, and um, First and Second Samuel would be just First Samuel. First and Second Kings would just be a single book. So they're, they're combined differently. And that was recognized as the Word of God. But but the so-called apocrypha books, First and Second, uh, Maccabees and Jubilees and Susanna and Bell and the Dragon and these other other books are not except they're good history. They're worth some of them, especially Maccabees, were worthy of reading because it's the history of what's going on during the intertestamental period. But it's not the Bible. It's not the Word of God. It's just good. And so because of that, Jerome, who translated the Old Testament and New Testament into Latin, and he was basically a, a monk at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Um, he spent his life translating, and he included that because if, in his in his preface to it, he says these are you need to learn some things from this, but it's not the Bible. But because it was included between the same covers as the Bible, people thought it was the Bible, and so eventually. It's accepted, but that doesn't happen until after the Protestant Reformation uh, at the Council of Trent. So we have the books that are in the canon and those that are not in the canon. They're not inspired. They're not part of, of the Word. So we see this process as God revealed things to the prophet, and he revealed himself in a certain way and certain events to, uh, to Moses and to others. And he brought these things to mind, or he told them about them. Now, the interesting thing is that when you look at the passage, uh, for example, the passage that we're, we'll look at in a minute, that, um, for example, in uh, Exodus thirty-two fifteen, when Moses is leaving the presence of God, we read, and Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. So he has two tablets, but they're written on the each is written on the front and back. You, as I pointed out last time, most times you see them pictured. You have one commandments one through five on one side, and six through ten on the other side. But you had two tablets. One tablet had one through five and six through ten on the back, and the other one was just like it. And they were the two copies that were to be preserved. In the Ark of, or by the Ark of the Covenant in the uh, tabernacle and then the temple. They were the, they were the legal copies of the contract that God had signed between him and, and the Israelites. So he comes down with the two tablets uh, of the testimony in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God. Now the tablets didn't have all 613 commandments. These are just had the Ten Commandments. They were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So God wrote those, and then God dictated the rest of the 603 commandments to Moses, and he wrote those down. 
And that's dictation. But most of, of the Old Testament is not dictation. It is, they use these historical records, the Toledotes in Genesis. These are the records of, of the universe. These are the records of Adam. These are the records of Noah. These are the records of Abraham. These are records that were probably carried by Noah on the ark. Uh, that is the antediluvian records. And then when you get to um, Moses, Moses has uh, these records that have been, these scrolls that have been preserved. So this is how it's handled and recorded by the prophet. So by the time Moses gets it, it's like he's doing a research project. He's got all this data, but he's got the ultimate researcher in his head. And that's God the Holy Spirit who's telling him what to edit out and what he needs to include. And that's what he writes. That's why you have you can see some different vocabulary and different styles in different parts of the Pentateuch is because that's coming from these records that Moses is using in the way that he is, is writing it. Of course, liberals came along and said, well, what this indicates is there were different authors and Moses didn't write it all. But Moses is the final editor of it and he had these, these documents ahead of time. They start with the presupposition, God, can't, God doesn't exist and even if he did exist, he couldn't communicate to man. And if he did, it wouldn't be like this. And so don't confuse me with facts because I've already made up my mind before I looked at any evidence. And that's basically how liberalism works. So um, Revelation twenty two eighteen and 19, anyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, these plagues will be added to, to them. So we need to look at Sinai as sort of a paradigm of how God works in terms of revealing things. So this is on, I think this is on page 15 in your notes. There are two things. First of all, Israel came into existence. Initially, God created the nation at the foot of Mount, at the foot of the Mount Sinai or, or at the Exodus, actually, well, because that's when they're given birth to. Uh, they get their laws at Mount Sinai. They get their land when they finally enter the land. And to have a nation, you need to have a group of people, you need to have a body of laws, and you need to have a land. So a body of laws would include having, having a ruler. So Israel comes into existence first, and then God is going to give them a set of laws subsequent to that. And he gave the law to Moses, who wrote it down, and Moses uh, recognized that you can't add to or subtract. You can't change this. You can't come in and edit it. Uh, you weren't going to be able to come in and take it to the Supreme Court and say, you know, this sixth commandment here, or this seventh commandment, that's a little tough to follow. Let's modify that a little bit. You couldn't do that. This was from God and it was unchangeable. So first God made them into a nation at the Red Sea, makes them uh, at Mount Sinai, gives them the law, and Israel comes under the law. It's part of a contract. They can't break the contract. They can't revise it, modify it in any way, shape, or form. But then you get to the New Testament and what happens? What happens is the church is given birth to in Acts chapter 2. And God begins to form the church. The church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And then over a course of the next um, 60 plus years, uh, God is going to complete the Bible. And then when it's finished, there's this curse at the end of the last book and so he's saying, you don't add to it. It's over and done with. God is not going to communicate again. He has communicated enough. And that's important because you'll hear people, even I've heard even a few fairly sound uh, pastors who say, and, and ministry leaders uh, that have fudged on this. They say, well, God spoke to me. No, he didn't. If you want to hear the voice of God, read the Bible out loud. And you'll hear what God's telling you. And God's not speaking. And that's the test. Are you really willing to trust God's word? Are you willing to, that, that God's word is going to be 
the final word, or are you going to look for something you can add to it to moderate what God has said, or to come up with some other solutions? Because, well, God's solution isn't quite the one I, I, I like. So it, biblical faith then, in the next section of the notes, is related to God's revelation. And we have, we've looked at inspiration, God breathing out, and the canon of Scripture. So faith is always related to the Word of God. And it is not just sort of a faith in faith or something that is, uh, that is irrational. The Word of God was revealed over a period of about 1,600 years by more than 40 different writers from three different continents and many different cultures, and yet they don't disagree on anything. And that's amazing. You can't get five people who are MAGA Republicans to agree on that much. Okay? But to get over 40 authors, some were shepherds, some were farmers. Amos was a fig picker and a herdsman. You've got Daniel, who was a prime minister, second in command, basically, in, per in um, Babylon. And then later in Persia, you've got Nehemiah, who is the chief cupbearer, which was a political position. He's like second in command to Artaxerxes in the Persian Empire. And you have all of these people in high places to, to very humble places, and they, they write and they don't disagree. This is critical. So we have Romans 10, 17, where Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is the word of God that is alive and powerful and sharper than two-edged sword. It is always related to content. Content, content, content. Not feeling, not emotion, not liver quiver, none of those things. And it is just based on what the words that God has said and understanding what those words mean and the structure in which they are presented. And God has communicated that way so it has stability. It can't be changed. It's not going to mean one thing to one generation and something else to another generation. It has a single foundational meaning. So he revealed himself through words structured in grammar and sentences and paragraphs. And he inspired the prophets and later the apostles uh, to record his word and that it was to be limited. These are the three points made in the notes. But, so that concludes just this brief introduction. More will be said about the development of the canon later on. But that gives us a starting point. Now we come to the second part of the lesson, which has to do with this rebellion that occurs at the foot of Mount Sinai. And I just find this to be one of the most instructive sections. And it has always impressed me. And I can remember when I was, I don't know how old, maybe 10 or 11, not later than 12, and they had a revival of the film, The Ten Commandments, the Cecil B. DeMille film where Charlton Heston uh, becomes Moses. And I watched it recently, and oh, it's just, um, you know, the melodramatic. It is, the acting is over the top, but, but still, I saw that film as a 11 or 12 year old kid, and when I read Exodus 32, my mind sees Charlton Heston on the mountain throwing down the tablets, and that's not right. You know why? Because that's Cecil B. DeMille's interpretation. And that's why I have a problem with this, this uh, what's, what's the series called that they have about, about Jesus? What? The Chosen, yeah. That's why I don't watch it. I don't want his vision or the actor's vision of what was going on in my head. Because I realize that there are things, when I see the parting of the Red Sea, it is Cecil B. DeMille's parting of the Red Sea. And when I see read Moses in my Bible, it is always Charlton Heston. 
And I'm sure that's true for many of you. And that ought not to be, because I'm not sure that's quite how it was. So, and it, it certainly Ramses wasn't the Pharaoh of the Exodus and didn't look anything like Yul Brenner. I don't have any trouble with that when I read about the Pharaoh of the Exodus because I know that it wasn't Ramses. That may be, you know, who knows, Ramses, but that's not the Pharaoh of the Exodus. That was probably, um, uh, it's not Tutmos, it's, um, hmm? Yeah, Amenhotep. Am Amenhotep the third. So that's where we are. Uh, we, we see this rebellion, and they're rebelling against Moses' leadership. And it's so interesting that, that when they first heard that God's going to give them the law, and you go back a few chapters, I think it's around um, chapter 24, verse th 3, they said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Okay? That lasted a little over 40 days. Probably didn't last that long. They were getting pretty restless. They were bored. And when you carefully read the text in Ex Exodus uh, 31 and 32, as Moses goes up on the mountain and they're, they're, they're engulfed in this cloud for seven days, and then he goes up higher where he's in the presence of God, and that says he was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So he's gone probably for about maybe 50 days. Well, that's seven weeks. That's almost two months. So if you're a leader and you're down camping out and he disappears up on the mountain, well, after probably about two or three weeks, you're getting pretty restless. Well, what's happened to Moses? What's going on? What are we supposed to do? I'm getting tired of sitting here. It's, it's, it's getting boring. I'm getting tired. We're using up all the firewood. Uh, things are getting kind of rough. The latrines need to be further and further away. I mean, anybody who's camped out anywhere knows that after two or three days, you're ready to go to a new campsite. And they're still there. So what's going to happen? Now, seven weeks has gone by, and it's like, okay. And th so they go to, go to Aaron, and they convince Aaron to make them gods that will go before them, that will lead them. Because this man Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's, what's happened to him. And so they've convinced Aaron that, that Moses is gone. So Aaron now, he's the older brother. Moses was the younger brother. Aaron's the older brother. And you know sometimes the younger brother just wishes the older brother would go away because he's always making mistakes. So maybe that was what was going on with Aaron. He wants to do something. So he has them all bring their, their gold and he melts it down. We're told the story that he received the gold and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And that's in, in verse 4. But when Moses confront, confronts him uh, later on, he says in, in um, verse 24, he says, well, they gave me all the gold and I just cast it into the fire and out popped this calf. You think he knew he did wrong, and he just doesn't want to admit it. There you see a perfect example of what happens when somebody violates responsible choice. So what's happening here is they have rejected God's leadership. They're not just rejecting Moses' leadership, but they're rejecting God's leadership. See, God has established authority and authority structures. So what, what they have done is they've set this up so that God instructs the leaders. You have Moses and Aaron. And then Moses and Aaron are to instruct the elders. And then they are to instruct the people. And so the people then obey the elders, and the elders obey Moses and Aaron, and Moses and Aaron obey God. And as you see the structure on the, on the uh, right panel, you have the elders plus the people are now telling Aaron what to do. And Aaron is going to do what the elders and the people have told him to do. And the person that is ignored is Yahweh and his servant Moses. So in verses 4 and 5, it tells us that uh, he took the gold from their hands, fashioned it with an engraving tube, made a molded calf, and they said, and then he said, 
This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. This is historical revisionism. This is like several presidents in recent history who have said things that are totally false because they're trying to rewrite history. And you hear this from a number of political leaders as well. They're trying to rewrite history. You have this whole thing called the you know, this 1619 Project that, that's trying to say that, that um, you know, these slaves were brought to Jamestown and they bought them as slaves and that's the beginning of slavery. No, it wasn't. If you know the real story, you know that one of they were all freed, and one of those black men became a very wealthy landowner, and he had a black slave and that was indentured, and he was supposed to work that off, but he was lazy, and so he didn't really work hard, and he really wasn't paying it off, and this was a real problem, so the black African man that came off of that slave ship takes his black indentured servant to court and said he needs to be my servant for life and this was the court case and it was resolved in his favor and that that was the beginning of black slavery in the colonies before that it was just indentured servitude now unless you've been in my church history class, none of you knew that. But that's what happened. And you can find that information, you go out on the internet and you find the court case, read the documents and everything else. It's all there. So, you know, historical revisionism. So people we know, people we hear talk about black reparations and all of this other stuff, they're making it all up. Their whole story, their whole narrative is made up out of thin air. And that's what's happening right here. And, and it's really important to understand why, why are they doing it that way. I want you to look at, he, at, at Exodus 32, 22. So Moses has come down and he's really upset. And he saw the calf and the dancing and the uh, New King James translates it, so Moses' anger became hot. Literally, it's no, Moses' nose burned. And he cast the tablets. See, the Hebrew is very, very uh, picturesque. And so when you get angry and your face gets all flush and red, your nose burns. So that was their idiom for, for anger. And, um, and so Moses is upset, and he takes the calf that they made, burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and then forced the children of Israel to drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, why did you do this? And you brought this great sin upon us. And Aaron's observation is just priceless here. He says, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. Isn't that interesting? He says, these are evil people. And later on, God calls them stiff-necked people. And God didn't choose them because they were, had an inclination towards righteousness at all. Okay, so we have a box question in the notes. Uh, some people believe that authority structures don't matter. And they feel like everyone should be equal and have the right to do whatever they want to do. And so, and, and today we see this in Congress. Well, I don't care what the law says. Let's have another law. Well, you've got to process the law. Say, no, I don't want to go through the process. They just may, want to make it up their antinomian. They're against law. They don't want to make up their rules. That's like getting in a chess tournament, and halfway through the chess tournament, all the chess players say, we, need, we don't like these rules. Let's make new rules. Because we just feel like these other people, they're so nice and sweet. They ought to be the winners. They're so genuine. So you, you can't do that. The rules are the rules. You stick with the rules. You have to be a group of or, or other. It just ends in anarchy. So that's the problem. And there are all, always these structures. So you have, uh, with God, you have responsible dominion where God's in charge, the mankind or the underlords over the creation and the animals. In the family, Yahweh's over the parents. The parents are over the children. And that works the other way. The children are answerable to the parents, and the parents are answerable to God. And then in civil government, Yahweh is over every government. 
and the government lead leaders are over the citizens, but the citizens are counter accountable to the government, and the government's accountable to God. So we come to Exodus 32, 20, and 21, and that I just went over that, and then also Aaron's insightful comment that, well, you know them, they're all evil. Then you look at verse 25. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron did not restrain them. You know, he was a permissive parent. He just let him get away with everything. He's sort of like the, the authority, government authority structures in New York and California. Uh, Aaron had not restrained them to the shame among their enemies. See, this is a big problem that you see through the Exodus generation is that all their enemies who, who, who first are f fearful because of what God did when they came out of Egypt, and now they see all their rebellion against God and their sinfulness, they're shamed. And, the, and the, uh, their enemies lose respect for them. So verse 26, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever's on the Lord's side come to me and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. That is just, that's always fascinated me that you're going to have this situation. Moses said, everybody for God come with me and everybody else is the enemy. And so they are going to execute 3,000 men of the people that day. That's a huge slaughter. That is a bloody, nasty, horrible mess. So this is what happened. He, he just tells everybody to grab their sword and kill them. And then Moses tears up the, breaks the law. He just stands there and he throws the law down in verse 19. Uh, but God, of course, is going to replace that later. And the Lord said to Moses earlier in the chapter, it says, I've seen this people and it's a stiff necked people. And God is saying, this is another remarkable part here because God says, just get out of my, my way and let me, let me kill them all. And how does Moses answer that? This is a test. You know, God wasn't going to do that, but this is a test for Moses and all these things are, you know, the being there for uh, 45 to 50 days, that's a test to see if the people are going to trust God even when it gets boring. And I've talked some in some of the Light from the Light episodes recently. A big test for people is just being alone. And, you're, you're in, and I've seen two or three programs on television that are dealing with this plague, they say, or this pandemic of loneliness. And it hits at two ends of the chronological spectrum. It hits when you're in your 20s and 30s and you're looking for somebody who can be uh, your partner in life to be married. And it hits at the other end when your partner either divorces you or, you, or dies and you're left alone. And there is a great yearning for somebody to be there. And I have seen so many people over the years, just fail in those tests. The Word of God has to be sufficient to get you through each and every test. And so you, and in today's world, I remember when, when uh, Phyllis Brown died and Gene came to me, oh, this was two or three years afterwards, and he'd gone out on a couple of dates. He said, Robbie, you've got to warn people, don't go out on dates when you're old. He said, the world is different. Nobody has any values, and it's just a horrible, horrible scene. It, it, it's nothing like what it was 50 years ago. And people need to learn to just, just be alone and, or to just be there and wait for God. Well, it's been 47 days, God. I'm done with it. I'm, I'm going to go solve my problem myself, and that's, that's exactly wh what they did. And now God wants to, to destroy them. And look, listen to Moses. Moses presents a case. This is a model of a prayer. Moses pleaded with the Lord and says, why does your, you let your wrath burn against your people? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them? He says, what's this going to do for all these other nations? They're going to say, oh, this is an evil, wicked God. You're going to destroy your reputation, God. And so that, that's, that's his line of evidence number one. He says, evidence number two, verse 13, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said you'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. 
Remember the covenant you made? You signed a contract. You can't go destroy them because you signed a contract. You've got to stick with your word. And see, God was testing him. Interesting thing. So I'm listening to the Quark's lesson on this while I'm walking this morning. And we all know that some of us, myself included, have some anomalies in their hearing. And so as they're reading this from the translation they're reading, it says God promised to make them humorous. Well, that's what I heard. (laughs) And I thought, well, that makes sense. There's lots of Jewish comics. God promised to make them humorous. Now, I knew what I, I immediately knew how I misheard the word and what the right word was supposed to be, but I just thought that was something worth sharing. So this is what's happening, is that Moses makes a case. That's how our prayer should be. We're looking at God's promises, and we're saying, Lord, this is not happening in my life, and I want to hold you to this promise that you have made. And so... uh, God is going to deal with them in justice. So that's what those, those verses are all about. So he takes them back to the Abrahamic covenant. You've got all these descendants, and you've made these promises. One of the promises you made is that the Savior is going to come through the line of Judah. Well, if you go kill them all right now, that's not going to come true. You've got to stay, stick with your promises. So God used this incident uh, to teach Moses about leadership and to grow him spiritually into a strong leader. Moses was the mo- Jesus said Moses was the most humble guy in the Old Testament. And humble doesn't mean that you're meek and mild. It means you're strong and you understand your relationship to authority. And if God wants you to do something, you're going to stand firm. Uh, Moses' reply, Exodus 32.11 Uh, Why does your wrath burn hot against the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? And Moses is affirming the truth. He's, God's testing him by pushing responsibility on him. And he even goes so far as, I'll make you the head of everybody. We'll start over with you. And um, Moses told God, no, no, you've got to, you've got to stick with your promise. And then he argues from the example that it would be uh, against the uh, Egyptians. And uh, Moses knows and understands three things. God wanted the world to know him and to be saved. And second, that God's plan was for the Israelites to represent him to the whole world. And they were to be a blessing uh, to the whole world. And third, that the plan God had for drawing the world to himself was to show to his people, the Israelites, his own glory. So Moses is basically saying, you're going to ruin your reputation, it's all over with. Verse 13, he says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore. So he's showing confidence in God's character and that he will fulfill the plan. And in verse 14, God relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. So based on Moses' interaction with God, God says, I'm not going to do it. But we know that God, that was God's plan all along. Second point is God used this incident to show, uh, show that the way Moses interceded for the Israelites, it's a picture of how Jesus intercedes for us. It's a great example for teaching, uh, teaching prayer to your, uh, to your kids. In verse 30, now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you've committed a great great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement or cleansing from your sin. In Deuteronomy uh, 9, 18 through 20, I've lost my place in the structure of these things. Moses says that he fell down before the Lord as at first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. You think they were going to party during those 40 days and 40 nights? You think they got bored during the second one? Not after what happened the first time. He said, I didn't eat bread or drink water because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. 
And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. So because Moses stood as an intercessor for the people, God didn't destroy them. So that's a picture of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us all the time. This is in 1 John 2, 1, where John says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So here's our chart. Now the chart in the book has been revised, and this is the revision, which you probably get a few more little changes. What we have is when we trust Jesus and what he did on the cross, then God restores relationships and provides eternal life as a result. So we move from being unrighteous to righteous man, man are blessed by God because there is just one God and one mediator. And so the third point is that God used the incident to teach the Israelites they needed to circumcise their hearts. This is clear in the Old Testament that physical circumcision was a picture of spiritual circumcision. So physical circumcision was an outward sign of the Abrahamic covenant, and in the Mosaic covenant it will be an outward sign of commitment to the covenant. So there's actually two purposes for circumcision, but it doesn't make a person right with God. God says in Deuteronomy 10.16, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So the circumcision of the heart has to do with an inward change from rebellion and sinfulness to obedience to God that sets the person apart, and it is an indication of their relationship with God. Romans 2.29 is going to apply it and New Testament applies it to what happens with the baptism by the Holy Spirit, which they did not have in the Old Testament. And Romans 2.29 says, But he is a Jew who is one outwardly, that's the physical genetic Jew, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. So the real Jew is one who's, who is not just one outwardly, but is one inwardly who has been circumcised by the Spirit. Colossians 2.11 says, In him, that is in Christ, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is what happens at the baptism by the Holy Spirit, which is what's referenced in the passage. So we get a box question after that. Is God reliable or does he change his mind about things? But Numbers 23.19 rather says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So God is going to do what he says to do, and often he will then uh, test us, uh, therefore, in the process. Another key passage, and this is a good passage for other reasons, but uh, Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The in, God says, the instant I speak concerning a nation. Now here he has in mind Israel. We understand that from the context, but he states it as a universal principle. Now you will hear a lot of people who will quote Second Chronicles seven fourteen, that if my people who are called by my name repent, repent and turn back to me, then I will bless their nation. That has nothing to do with the United States of America or anyone else. In, in um, uh, First Kings, you, you have Solomon dedicate the temple. And he goes through this whole prayer. And in the prayer he says, Lord, when they do this, what he's doing is he's going through the sins in the five cycles of discipline. When they rebel against you, when they commit a, idolatry, when they're doing this and when they're doing that, then then you know, remember them. When you finally take them out of the land, remember them. And so God's answering that prayer in Second Chronicles 7. The prayer is actually a few chapters before that. And then God answers it and he says, 
he answers Psalm, he says, you just prayed that if the people turn back to me, I will restore them to the land. And so God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and turn to me, then I will, uh, I will bless them and restore, restore their nation. It has nothing to do with anybody else. This is the verse that states the universal principle. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, to de- and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. That's the verse we need. These are the verses we need to be going to, not 2 Chronicles 7.14. So we have various passages in that use this. It's called an anthropopathism. Pathos is from a Greek word that relates to emotion, relates to suffering actually, but relates to suffering. And so it's a picture of God um, having emotions that he doesn't actually, human emotions that he doesn't actually have. Uh, anthropomorphism, the morph is a, from a la- uh, Greek word meaning a, a um, form or structure. And so it is attributing to God human forms, arms, legs, eyes, ears, that God doesn't actually possess in order to communicate something to us. So you have the same thing with regard to physical f- human form as well as human emotions. God says, I am, not a, I am not like you. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God is different. He is infinite. And, um, you know, I remember someone I know and respect, so I won't use his name, wrote an article published in a theological journal arguing that God had emotion. And one of his first things was he went to Exodus 32, and he said, see, God has great wrath here. And I said to him, I said, using his name, I said, the Hebrew, and he was a Hebrew major, the Hebrew says his nose burned. Is that a figure of speech? Yes. It's an anthropomorphism, because God doesn't have a nose. So it's an anthropomorphism that was used as an anthropopathism. God didn't have a nose any more than he was angry. Nobody wants a judge that's angry. You don't want to go into court and have an emotional judge. You want to have a, an objective judge who looks at the facts and makes an objective decision. And when that calls for a harsh penalty, we say the judge threw the book at them. But that's an emotional statement. It's a figure of speech that they got the f- punished with the f- to the full extent of the law. And so when we use idioms like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the judge stood up and got angry and picked up a law book and threw it at them. We wouldn't like that. We don't want a judge who will do that. We want him to be calm and objective and do what the law says to do. So these are anthropopathisms. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the face of the earth. So third, how then should we understand what happened between God and Moses when God said he changed his mind? That's the thought question. So what happens is that God had put this out as a test. And he did this and said those things as a test to see how Moses would react. And Moses reacted in prayer and rational, logical thought working through the promises of God. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Next time we'll come back and start in chapter, or lesson 16. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things tonight. And we just ask that you help us to understand them and apply them and recognize that, that we probably would have been doing the same thing in rebellion uh, with the, at, the, at the foot of Mount Sinai as well because the heart is deceptive and wicked above all things. Who can know it? Only you can know it. And so, Father, we pray that you'd help us to see 
the truth of all these things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.